Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Collins and I'm a lecturer in musicology at UWA's Conservatorium of Music. I'm here to give you a brief description of the style and context of Nina Simone's song Young, Gifted and Black for your ATAR music exam as one of your set works under the theme of identities. Thinking of how the song articulates with the theme of identities will involve two separate videos. In this video, we'll talk about the context for the work in relation to the civil rights movement and black nationalism in the USA in the 1960s, as well as intersectional issues related to a combination of racial and gender identity. In the second video, we will discuss the textual and musical elements of the song that make it both a reflection of its context as well as an active agent of change within it. So first, the civil rights movement and black nationalism. The song Young, Gifted and Black is a tribute to Nina Simone's late friend Lorraine Hansberry, who was the first African-American woman to have a play performed on Broadway and who had introduced Simone to the civil rights movement. After Hansberry's untimely death in 1965 at the age of 34, her ex-husband, Robert Nemiroff, drew together some of her unfinished writings to make a play titled Young, Gifted and Black, Lorraine Hansberry in her own words. And this is where the title of Nina Simone's song comes from. Weldon Irvine assisted Simone in composing and writing the lyrics for the song. Now, it would be easy to see the song Young, Gifted and Black as simply a straightforward musical expression of the civil rights movement in the tradition of protest song, making the movement and the protest song tradition the appropriate context for the piece. But there are a few things that make it distinctive. Indeed, in the manner of a good song, the piece itself offers a gateway into understanding some important nuances in the context that surrounds it. Following her acquaintance with Hansberry, Simone supported civil rights groups such as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Congress of Racial Equality, and the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People, and she performed for many black activist fundraising events. Simone came into political consciousness through her involvement with the cultural avant-garde and the political left, and she performed for many black activist fundraising events. Simone came into political consciousness through her involvement with the cultural avant-garde and political left in Greenwich Village and Harlem in the late 1950s, a community that included revolutionary political activists such as James Baldwin and Amiri Baraka. And I've included some links to videos of political speeches by these figures, which provides some really important context for Simone's politicisation. Now, it's important to note that Simone's activism came to be on the radical edge of black nationalism, as opposed to the vision of interracial unity and desegregation of the more liberal civil rights movement, including the folk revival. Her first civil rights song of 1963, Mississippi Goddamn, was written in response to the murder of Medgar Evers and the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, a state that was known for its high level of racist violence. The song also came shortly after the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, where Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. And it's worth listening to this speech all the way through beyond the usual sound bites to really get a sense of what it was describing and comparing this with what people like James Baldwin and Amiri Baraka were calling for. Simone's song, Mississippi Goddamn, offers a window into her attitude toward the civil rights movement's push for desegregation and associated reforms. Namely, she thought they were too slow and that other more radical methods were required. Simone's involvement in these nuanced and complex social protest movements is important to unpack through this and others of Simone's songs around this time, not least because it reminds us that protest song and black activism and the civil rights movement are not singular phenomena. They don't all have the same end in mind. I also wanted to say a word about intersectionality. Now, it's important not to pigeonhole Nina Simone as reducible to her racial identity and to racial identity politics. Indeed, many of her songs address matters of both racial and gender identity, as well as the intersectional identities that arise from being an African-American female musician in a male-dominated industry. Reviewers of her work throughout her career played up the idea of a young African-American girl growing up in a poor family in the rural South, becoming classically trained in the elite European art music tradition, and then gaining attention in the even more elite and even more masculine Manhattan jazz scene. Simone was actively positioned as a performer who stood apart from the more commercial, popular performer, as well as from the idea of the instinctive black entertainer of the 1950s, as well as standing apart from the image of the sultry female jazz singer. 
She was understood to be a classically trained jazz performer who associated with avant-garde artists and who had a prodigiously high level of skill and originality and with a reputedly difficult temperament to match. Indeed, the fact that Simone was said to be difficult to work with has been ascribed by some to the fact that people were willing to accept this behaviour from men under the banner of genius, but not from women. With Nina Simone's focus on the relationship between black nationalism and gender in particular, her work pointed forward to what would become an increasing awareness of the intersectional discrimination through second wave feminism and the black power movement. These contextual details provide an important backdrop for understanding Simone's song, Young, Gifted and Black. And we will turn in the next video to the textual and musical elements of that song that are linked with your theme of identities.